dollars and then <laughs> where's the money? <laughs> Sounds sketchy. <laughs> Uh, we have someone from Louisville, Kentucky. Hi. I grew up outside Louisville, Kentucky in Indiana. So uh, Louisville's yeah. a great town. Yeah. Charlottesville. I wonder, the person from Smith Mountain Lake, are you sitting outside on the water right now? <laughs> Such a pretty day. I know the rest of us are wishing we could be sitting outside on the water right now. So North Carolina. Okay. So um, it's 12.02 right now. So I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. I'm Rowena Zimmerman. I'm the communications director of Blue Ridge Prism, and I am so happy that you're joining us today for our lunchtime brown bag webinar, Tree of Heaven and the Spotted Lanternfly. Um, with me today, helping out um, with this webinar are Beth Mizell, our program director, as well as our two invasive management specialists, Natalie Walker and Tom Sayeli. Um, we're, really we're really excited to have Tim Maywalt and Lori Chamberlain here today as our presenters. And um, I just wanna go over um, some really quick things with you right now, um, just to make sure the webinar runs smoothly for you. Um, if you have any audio issues, the slide is to help you kind of troubleshoot that. That is my dog, Rosie that the um, director of our program, Beth, is determined to make love her, even though Rosie likes to turn around and just <laughs> walk away when she sees Beth. But Rosie's like just kind of a one person gal. So, but anyway, back to the audio issues. Um, if you joined um, and you can't hear us very well, try to follow some of these steps and hopefully um, that'll help you be able to hear us better. Um, I know sometimes it can be difficult with you know connectivity and stuff. So um, this slide is to help you do that. Um, sometimes it really helps to just go into Zoom instead of trying to connect to us through Eventbrite. Um, coming up in the fall, we have, which is hard to believe, it's just around the corner. We have our um, spring workshop, our, I'm sorry, our fall workshops. And I have up just the uh, um, graphics from the two online workshops we're gonna be having. Um, the 12th will be the, um, the one on identification of invasive plants and the 13th will be on management and control. And we would love for you to join us on that. We'll also have our in-person um, workshop, which will be both identification and management and control of invasive plants at Penn Park in Charlottesville on the 15th. You can find out more information about these webinars or workshop um, on our website, www.blueridgeprism.org. And you can also register. Uh, registration is open for all of these events. Um, our fall quarterly meeting will take place on October 18th, and we're really excited to announce that Doug Tallamy will be our keynote speaker. This will be a free online event, so everyone near and far can attend. Once again, check our website for additional details. Registration is open now. Um, at the end of today's webinar, we're going to have time for questions, um, so just make sure um, that you um, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and that's where we ask for you to type in your questions, and then Tom, Natalie, and Beth will um, take a look at them and make sure that um, they can be funneled towards um, Tim or Lori, and we'd be happy to answer as many as we can, time permitting, at the end of this webinar. Um, but I know that we won't always have, we won't have a lot as much time as needed to answer all of your questions. So make sure to um, contact us at info at blueridgeprism.org with any additional questions that you don't feel we were able to answer and we'll be happy to get back to you. Okay, as you leave today's meeting, please take a moment to complete an exit survey. 
and tell us how we can best serve you in the future. We would really appreciate it. Uh, once again, this webinar is being recorded. So everyone who registered for today's webinar will get um, an email with the link to the recording. Today, we are so happy to have Lori Chamberlain, um, Forest Health Program Manager at the P Department of Forestry, talk with us about the spotted lanternfly. And following her will be Tim Maywald, um, who is a really important part of the Blue Ridge Prism Leadership Team and is a Charlottesville area tree steward. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Lori. All right, see if I can share my screen here. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. Now I'm also gonna say hi to everyone and then turn off my video <laughs> so it's not distracting. All right, so thanks for having me today. Um, I'm going to give a short background on the spotted lanternfly and where it has been found in Virginia, um, which could which should shut, set the stage for the next presentation about Tree of Heaven. So this is the spotted lanternfly. Um, it is an insect that is native to Asia, so it's non-native and invasive here in North America. It was first discovered in North America and Pennsylvania in 2014 and first discovered in Virginia in 2018 in Winchester. Um, and now it's established in many states and you'll be able to see that on some maps that I show a little later on. It is a hemipteran in the Fulgoridae family um, and it goes through the life stages that you can see here. First the egg, and then the eggs hatch and you have nymphs that develop through four instars or um, developmental stages and then finally the adult. So we'll start with the egg masses. Um, on the left is a great photo of an adult female laying an egg mass. And so the, the females lay their eggs in rows and then they cover them with a waxy secretion. And so the photo on the right, you can see the individual rows of eggs um, just coming out of the egg mass that the female didn't uh, completely cover. When the egg mass um, is first laid, it's shiny and white, but then it will darken and fade over time and turn more powdery and kind of gray as it dries. And there are approximately 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass and a female can lay up to two egg masses. Egg masses are inch and a half long, they're flat and gray, and they're laid on smooth surfaces such as um, tree trunks and branches, uh, rocks, stones, lawn furniture, cars. Um, they also seem to like rusty metal. Uh, to me, these egg masses just kind of look like a blob of clay on the, on the surface of whatever they've been laid on, um, and they can be really cryptic and difficult to find. So here you can see egg masses on a variety of objects, a tree trunk, um, but also on stone and wood in the center here, which I believe is actually a part of a bench. So they really do lay these egg masses on pretty much anything outside. Um, and because they lay egg masses on so many things, this is the life stage that is most at risk of being transported to new areas. Um, these egg masses could be laid on vehicles or any outdoor equipment. And so then if those items are moved to another place before they hatch, you could potentially be introducing spotted lanternfly to a new area. So it's really important to be able to identify the egg masses. Um, they can be really camouflaged and hard to spot, especially when you first start looking, but you do tend to develop a search image after you find a few. And so this is a really great publication that the Virginia Cooperative Extension put out. Um, it shows spotted lanternfly egg mass lookalikes in Virginia. So if you go outside and you start looking for egg masses, you're probably going to find them because a lot of our native insects lay egg masses, and some of them look a bit like spotted lanternfly egg masses. So up here in the um, left corner, you can see two photos of spotted lanternfly egg masses. This one um, in the very corner has a covering on it. And then this one, um, one over, it has the eggs, but for some reason the, the adult didn't cover them. 
But then also on this publication, you see a lot of photos of other egg masses that were laid by other insects that may look like the spotted lanternfly egg. So we've got spongy moth here, um, a praying mantis egg case, wheel bugs, and then also even lichen on a tree. Sometimes if you're looking up into the canopy and you see lichen on the bark of a tree can look just like a spotted lanternfly egg mass. So it's important to know how to distinguish spotted lanternfly egg masses from all other possible lookalikes, and this is a really good document to reference. Um, I think you can find it by searching spotted lanternfly in Virginia, um, just on Google, and that'll help you get to the Virginia Tech spotted lanternfly page, and it has a bunch of resources, including this fact sheet. But on to nymphs. These are the nymphs. They go through four instars or developmental stages. Um, the first three instars are black with white spots. And then the final fourth instar is the largest and it develops a red coloring. These nymphs generally hatch in mid-April and are present through the summer. And finally, here are the adults. The adults have black bodies and wings that are um, usually held tent-like behind them when at rest. The adults are about an inch long when resting with their wings back, um, but when their wings are spread, they have a wingspan of about an inch and a half. And so the four wings, those top wings, are tan and gray with black spots, and then the hind wings are banded black and white with that um, deep red color. And the adults are pretty active, and this is the only stage that can fly, although they do tend to kind of hop more than they fly. So when you see them on a plant, they'll probably just be walking or hopping along, but if they get disturbed or if you try to grab them, that's when you'll see them fly away. So here's another fact sheet put out by Virginia Cooperative Extension, and this shows the different life stages um, and when they're present in Virginia. And so these times are slightly ahead of what folks are observing further north in Pennsylvania, um, and they also may be different than what states south of us will experience. But after uh, multiple years of observing spotted lanternfly in Virginia, this is the life cycle that we've observed. So the eggs um, hatch and you start to see nymphs in mid-April and they're present through the summer. And then adults start emerging in July and they're present through the fall. And then you'll start to see egg masses in the fall and the egg masses are the stage that overwinters. So we know spotted lanternfly is invasive, but why is it bad? Um, well, it has a wide host range, meaning it will feed on a lot of plants, over 60 different species, but it definitely does prefer Alanthus, tree of heaven, which we all know is an invasive species itself. Um, so, you know, if it just fed on Alanthus, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Maybe we would think of it as some sort of biocontrol, um, but unfortunately it feeds on a lot of other plants as well. And so the presence of Alanthus may be what has allowed it to survive and establish populations in some areas. But other plants that also tend to be preferred are grapevine, maple, walnut, and then like 60 other species. So what damage do they cause? Um, lanternflies are flow and feeders, so they insert their piercing sucking mouth parts into the plant tissue and then they feed on the plant sap. Now on trees, we're not really sure um, how much direct damage spotted lanternfly can cause. We do know in heavy populations, um, some yellowing and browning of foliage and also branch dieback has been observed and mortality has been observed on tree of heaven that has been fed upon heavily. Um, to my knowledge, mortality has not really been observed on any other species, but certainly the feeding will weaken the tree and just make it much more susceptible to other insect pests and diseases. Um, but it's such a new pest that there hasn't been time to fully understand the long-term impact to trees. However, on fruit crops, feeding may reduce yield, uh, specifically for grape and fruit trees. So high levels of feeding, it can stress the plant and just decrease plant health. And in some vineyards um, in Pennsylvania, they've started seeing significant yield loss, like up to 90%. And they're just having to apply more insecticides to protect their crops, which then can substantially increase the cost of production. And then also as spotted lanternfly feeds on all that plant sap, it excretes a sticky sugary substance called honeydew. 
and then sooty mold can grow on top of the honeydew. And so that's what you're seeing here in these photos, all of that black on the tree trunk and the leaves, that's sooty mold growing on the honeydew that was excreted by the feeding lanternflies. And now honeydew and sooty mold, they probably don't directly impact the plant, but when leaves are covered with sooty mold, that definitely decreases the surface area available for photosynthesis. So that probably does have an indirect impact on the health of the plant. And then also spotted lanternfly is just, it can be a significant nuisance, nuisance pest. Um, I like insects, I enjoy finding insects in my yard, but this is not something I would want to encounter in my yard. Um, when, when they are in high numbers, you can hear and feel the honeydew falling down like rain, and it can cover anything outside, such as decks, uh, vehicles, outdoor furniture, and then that sooty mold that we just saw that can grow on all of those surfaces. So um, spotted lanternfly really has the potential to be a significant nuisance pest. Okay, so now I'm just gonna show you a few maps of um, where we have confirmed spotted lanternfly. So here's a map of where it has been confirmed in North America. Um, again, it was first confirmed in North America and Pennsylvania in 2014. And now it looks like, you know, more than half of Pennsylvania counties have spotted lanternfly. Um, so on this map, the counties highlighted in blue have an established reproducing population. Um, there have been many individual finds, like where they found one egg mass or one adult. And I believe you can see those spots on this map kind of in these pink purple dots. Um, but unless there's an established, it has to be like an established reproducing population for the county to, to be highlighted blue on this map. So, you know, unfortunately there are over a dozen infested counties in Virginia and you can see that it's spread to many other states. And here's a map um, of the Virginia counties. This map is updated by Virginia Tech. So the red counties are part of the spotted lanternfly quarantine um, and they have established populations. And then the yellow counties on this map, they just have a light local population um, and they're not yet part of the quarantine. And finally, since I mentioned the quarantine, I'll show you this map. Um, spotted lanternfly is a regulated pest, so we do have a spotted lanternfly quarantine in Virginia, which is regulated by VDAX, the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And so um, when the quarantine was first established a few years ago, it was just those green counties at the northern tip of the state where spotted lanternfly was um, first discovered in Virginia. But now it has expanded to include, include all of the counties highlighted on this map. Uh, this change went into effect last month. And the, the goal of the quarantine is to prevent spotted lanternfly from spreading further. So businesses that move items outside of the quarantine area, they have to go through training and get a permit from BDAX. Um, and residents that leave the quarantine area are just asked to quickly inspect their vehicles to make sure they don't have any lanternflies hitching a ride. So if anyone has any questions about the quarantine, you can ask me or you can reach out to the VDAX plant industry folks directly. So that is my contact information and I will stop sharing so that we can turn it over to Tim. Thank you, Lori, that was really informative. And now we're going to move on to um, Tim Maywald, who's going to talk about how to identify and control the Ailanthus tree, the tree of heaven, which is the main host plant for the spotted lanternfly. Tim? Yeah, I can't share yet because it uh, looks like I can maybe now. There we go. Okay. Alrighty, so <clears throat> here what we're looking at is a, a whole line of uh, mainly female Ailanthus. You can tell they're female from a few hundred yards away because of all of these seed clusters. These aren't leaves that you're looking at. This is all seed clusters. And in this particular photo, we're probably looking at 250,000 to 300,000 seeds. It's a prolific seeder. So even if we're fortunate where we live, to never see spotted lanternfly, there's plenty of good reason to be controlling Tree of Heaven. It wants to take over our forests. And as you can see here, this is what a, an Atlantis forest looks like, Tree of Heaven forest. I'll use the term Atlantis because it's faster than Tree of Heaven. Um, in addition to being a prolific uh, reproducer, 
It also is allelopathic, which simply means that it issues a chemical from its roots, which inhibits the growth of any other species. And that's why you end up with you have very dense trees because it seeds so prolifically. And then there's nothing else growing here, native. Uh, here you've got some uh, bittersweet, here you've got some um, autumn olive, but basically it outcompetes everything. So you end up with a forest, which is essentially a dead forest. You know, nothing eats them, nothing native eats them because they didn't develop together with them over millennia. So it's really quiet. There's no bugs, there's no birds. It's kind of eerie. Anyhow, we'll look at uh, identification. We'll look at controlling with herbicide. We'll look at trying to control without herbicide. And uh, no matter how you go at it, it's not a job that's gonna be done overnight. Um, because it's such a prolific seeder, there's a seed bank out there. There's seed, wherever there are Atlantis, there's seed in the ground and they're gonna keep coming up over a number of years into the future, even if you kill every Ilanthus that's out there. Um, if you don't use herbicide, you're going to have root sprouting, and we'll talk about that mechanism shortly. So um, it's a job you're going to have to stay on top of. Um, <clears throat> you know, I just showed you a bunch of females, and like I say, you can spot them from not quite a mile away, but from a long ways away. Females are easy to identify most of the year. Um, I find any identification, male or female, to be easier in the winter because you don't have uh, uh, a lot of foliage obstructing your view of the trunk. And if you see the trunk, you can usually identify it like that. It's pretty unique. We'll look at these things in a minute. Uh, leaf ID can be a little tricky because there are some lookalikes. Uh, walnut, um, if it's a small tree, it could be mistaken for a sumac. The leaves could anyhow. <clears throat> So you wanna use a couple of different features to confirm. I mean, you may know right away that, that you've got an Ilanthus. If you're not quite sure, look at a couple of different features, uh, bark, leaves, seed clusters. I'll show you what the seedlings look like and root sprouts and so on. And their smell, it has a unique odor. But here's what your females look like right now. Um, they, they, they leaf out in uh, early June. They're usually completed with leaf out around here in Piedmont, Virginia in early June. And within a few weeks of that, they put out their leaf clusters. And this is what a leaf cluster, excuse me, a seed cluster looks like close up. One thing I'd point out to you is um, notice at the tips of each seed capsule, there's a twist. That's uh, what, what it does is it causes the seed as it breaks away and falls to spin. And that spinning action keeps it in the air longer. It's kind of like a maples, you know, maples have two Samaras and they spin like a helicopter. The purpose of that adaptation is to keep it in the air longer so it spreads further away from the parent plant. And here's what they look like in the winter. You know, they lose their bright color and become kind of dull, but they will hold these seed clusters into not as many, you know, they're, they're falling off all the time starting in uh, about September. But by the time you get to March, you probably still have some, maybe even into uh, April. So females are easy to ID. Oh, I noted seed viability can exceed 65%. Kind of a scary tree. So this is what the seedlings look like in the winter. And there's nothing else out there really that looks like this. You just have these sticks coming up. And the, the, the reason for this is until an Ilanthus seedling or root sprout gets to be about um, 10, 12 feet tall, they don't do any lateral branching. They don't have to because their leaves are so big, they provide a, a really large photosynthetic surface. They don't need lateral branches because their leaves are so big. So their young ones look like this and you can spot them in the forest like that. If you see this, there are adults around, there are mature trees around. But this is pretty much uh, the way most of us spot Ilanthus out there in the world. It has a um, pretty unique bark. Uh, it's relatively flat, it's patterned, um, perhaps in a pattern you, you'd find on a cantaloupe. Some people call it snakeskin, typically gray. Uh, as they mature, they'll often get darker and darker, but there is some variety. Here's a bunch of Ilanthus. Um, these two over on this end that are the lighter color are small ones. These are four to six inches. <clears throat> they tend to darken over time. 
but here's one where you can barely discern the pattern. And with these, you don't see a pattern at all. So if, if you're looking at a leaf and you think you have it, look at the bark. If you still don't know for sure, uh, well, let's, let's do this first. You're not going to mistake an ailanthus uh, for a walnut or a sumac, where you could if you were just looking at their leaves. So we'll look at these leaves in a minute and, and look at all the features of the leaves you can focus on. But bark is totally different. So if you're kind of stymied looking at leaf and wondering, hmm, what have I got here? This is walnut. You'll never mistake that for that or that. Same thing for sumac. You know, sumac's not a big tree. It'll only be 15 to 18 feet tall. If you've got a 40 foot tree, it's not a sumac. But its bark is quite identifiable as well. It's very flat um, and it has these lumps on them, which are an organ called a lenticel. It's a gas exchange organ. But, you know, look at the bark and you'll, you'll know you're not dealing with ailanthus. <clears throat> um, in the winter, the tree is exposed, you know, the foliage is off and you can see its structure. And here we're looking at a hackberry, which could just as easily be an oak, a beech, uh, a maple. And you'll see there's lots and lots of branches and they're relatively fine. Then you look at the ailanthus and you see that it's relatively sparse in branching. Uh, again, because it has such huge leaves. And if you look at the, the leaf tips, You'll notice that when you get way down to the tip, they're very blunt. And they're blunt at the tip because they have to be able to support the weight of these big two foot leaves. And sometimes you'll see these little whip like things stuck at the end of the branches. And what those are is uh, this feature right here, which is technically called a rachis. Uh, the thing about Ailanthus is this, this whole thing is one leaf. This is called a compound leaf. So it's different from a maple or an oak or a beech, which has one little leaf like this. These parts are, are referred to as leaflets and they're all part of one leaf. So this is a two footer and that's kind of average. You'll see them a, a foot and a half. You'll see them as big as three feet. So a very, very large leaf. <clears throat> Let's compare them with the things that you might from a distance uh, mistake it for. When I'm driving along a highway and I'm looking on the side of the road, which unfortunately I do a lot of, I'm, I'm dangerous when I'm in a car <clears throat> around trees. Uh, sometimes I'll see walnut. This is walnut. This is black walnut. 98% of the walnuts you're going to see out there in the woods are black walnut. There are a few white walnuts. This is uh, also known as butternut. But the, their leaves look pretty much the same. And then this is sumac. So you can see they're kind of similar. So let's focus on some of the differences. For Ailanthus, it is in almost every case going to have a leaflet right at the tip. Walnut does not. Okay, now nature isn't all that big on uniformity and consistency like people try to be. So you can see some variation here, but by and large, Ailanthus is gonna have a terminal leaflet. Walnut is not. Um, another thing, when you look at sumac, you can see that it has very obvious teeth on the edges of each leaf, leaflet. Ailanthus has a smooth edge. So if you look close, <clears throat> you got a smooth edge on Ailanthus. These two are Ailanthus. You have very fine teeth on walnut, and you have larger, more obvious teeth on sumac. Another thing to look at is the base of the leaf on Ailanthus, and you'll see there's a notch. There's always a notch down at the bottom on both sides. You can see the notches here. And if you would turn the leaf over, you can see this little gland right at the tip of the notch. You do not have that on sumac. You do not have it on walnut. So I guess the last thing I've mentioned is uh, uh, Ailanthus leaves have a pretty strong odor and it's not a pleasant odor. Unlike walnut or, or even sycamore, they're, they're quite smell. If you were to take a, a leaf and tear it apart and sniff, uh, it's very pleasant. It's not so pleasant with ailanthus, and particularly on a hot day, you'll smell them. They're they're not. They don't smell good. <clears throat> okay, so much for ID. Lots of different ways to identify them. Lots of different ways to separate them from their lookalikes. Uh, for control. One piece of good news out there in the world is that it's very easy to handful fairly long uh, Ailanthus. 
um, three or four feet is usually no problem as long as the soil is moist. I pulled uh, six footers, seven footers, eight footers and gotten their complete root structure out of the ground, which is the goal of hand pulling. And hand pulling is great because you don't need an herbicide. Uh, we'll, we'll look at this technique in some detail in a minute. We'll look at all of these techniques in detail in a minute. If you are an herbicide user, and almost everyone I know that deals with Dilanthus uses herbicide because it's extremely difficult to control without it. Uh, they're gonna use techniques, which I will get into in detail in a minute, uh, called cut stump, where you basically cut the tree down and put a little herbicide around the edges of the stump or a technique called hack and squirt, which is where you use a hatchet or a machete, you cut an opening into the, the trunk of the tree and then insert an herbicide because you've opened up the vascular tissue to allow the herbicide to get in. Um, and there are occasions when you can spray, uh, you can use what's called foliar application and you can spray herbicide on the leaves of a, of a uh, Atlantis, which you would only do for small ones, ones where you're spraying down. And I'll show you the technique in a minute. Now, if, if you're not an herbicide user and want to try to control Hylanthus, um, for a mature tree, you're either going to cut it down or you're going to use a technique called girdling where you kill the tree in place by severing all of its vascular tissue all around the trunk, which makes it impossible for the plant to move water and nutrients upward to feed the tree it makes it impossible for food that's produced through photosynthesis to be able to get down through the trunk and into the roots for storage to be used in the winter when they're dormant. <clears throat> so you'll fell it or you'll girdle it. Uh, the issue with that is, is if you kill an Ailanthus or if it dies of natural causes, you know, it's blown down in a windstorm or pulled down by uh, invasive vines or snow, <clears throat> the plant goes into its natural survival response mode, which is it releases um, chemicals into its entire root system that spur the growth of root sprouts. And I'll, I'll show this to you in a minute. If you don't use an herbicide, you get root sprouts and you don't get a few of them, you get dozens and dozens of them. And that, you know, you, you got rid of one tree and now you got 50 or 100 new ones. So not using an herbicide creates a long-term management issue for you. So here's girdling, <clears throat> definitely not recommended because it's gonna cause root sprouting. But uh, the uh, vascular tissue, the veins and arteries as it were of the, the tree, some of them move water and nutrients upward to feed the tree. Some of them move, uh, produce food downward into the trunk for storage. They are located right under the bark right in here. So if you cut all that out, all the way around the tree, it can't move liquids and it dies. So here you see it done on this one. This is actually a Paulonia. Uh, this is Ailanthus. I mean, you can use a technique on any tree, it will kill it. But with these invasive trees, you generate for yourself a whole lot of new work. So here's the three most common <clears throat> control techniques that are used for Ailanthus. Uh, I mentioned hand pulling. Secondly, this is what's called cut stump, where you cut the tree down. And if you're an herbicide user, you would then apply a small amount of herbicide right around the edges where the vascular tissue is. And this technique is called uh, hack and squirt, where you hack into the trunk with a hatchet or a machete and create an opening. And then you apply some herbicide, a very small amount, a couple milliliters into that opening because you've opened up the vascular tissue and this allows the herbicide to move downward through the tree on the point where you put the hack into the roots. That's where amb uh, herbicides do their damage is in the roots. So if it doesn't sound like that would work, let me show you that indeed it does work. Uh, here's a hack has been put into this tree at this point. You can see the herbicide was applied as the blue. <clears throat> And here we are 14, 16 inches down, and here you see the herbicide moving downward into the roots. So this works really well during the growing season because there's a lot of downward movement through the vascular system during the growing season. But how does it get down there when the tree's dormant, when there isn't any movement through the vascular system? Well, gravity. So it works in the winter as well. It works during dormancy as well. 
not quite as well, a little bit slower, uh, which gets into what's the optimal time for herbicide treatment, and we will talk about that. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take you through this um, stand of Ilanthus. Everything you're seeing here in front of this row of pines in the background, and there's a bunch of Chinese privet over here, but everything in the foreground and, and all the way back to these big trees here, with the exception of this one maple, is Ilanthus. These little six inches that are popping up, these three footers, these six footers, these six inches trees, all Ilanthus. <clears throat> so I'll show you how I uh, would work my way through this stand treating with herbicide. Where I can't hand fall, it's too big to hand fall. So this is the after picture. And, and you may be saying, well, what, what's going on here? Take a look at this one is broken. This one's broken. This one's snapped off here, snapped off here, 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 here. What's going on here? Well, here's what's going on. You start with the smallest ones, which you can hand pull. You know, as long as the soil is moist, um, here's a three and a half footer that I hand pulled. And you can see I've got the complete root system. Didn't leave any roots in the ground. It cannot regrow. Yay, we won one. So the way you do it, uh, if, if if you've done hand pulling before, you, you know the procedure. The, the very first one you hand pull on a given day is a test of soil moisture. So you grab a hold of it. You can see I'm grabbing a hold of this one about a foot off the ground. And the first one you pull, you're gonna pull very gently, firmly, and you're gonna know within two seconds whether it's gonna come or not. And if it comes, it comes. If it's resisting you strongly, stop. Because what you don't wanna do, you don't want to break it off and leave this root structure in the ground because it'll grow back, okay? So start pulling. If it comes, hooray. If it doesn't come, well, you already have your hand on it. These little saplings are very brittle. They're very simple to break. You just snap it, snap, and it's gone. And what you've done is you've opened up its vascular system and you just put on a drop or two of herbicide. That herbicide is gonna do the same thing. It's gonna go down to uh, the ground level down into the roots and kill the roots so it will not regrow. So you snap it like this. Sometimes it breaks all the way off. You see it lying here. Just put on a couple drops of herbicide. That's it. <coughs> now you're going to start getting into bigger ones. And again, in the background here, these are all Atlantis. This is a big stand of Atlantis. So here's one that's maybe an inch, inch and a half. And I always have a hatchet with me because I use hack and squirt mostly. And um, you know, I've got a hold of it up about uh, five feet high, you know, up is about my head. And I just tap it at about the four foot level with, with the hatchet. And then I can break it. And then I apply a little bit of herbicide right around the edge. But sooner or later, you're gonna get the ones that you, you can't break anymore. They're too big to hand pull, too big to break. And then you get into this technique called hack and squirt. And we'll, we'll go into this in detail because it is the most common procedure used to control Ilanthus by foresters anywhere. It's the most efficient, it's the fastest, it's the most effective. So what you do is you take your hatchet and you hack into the side of the tree, and then you come over to this side and hack into it, and then you apply a little bit of herbicide. Um, oh, you, well, okay, let, let me take it kind of step by step. So one thing that's kind of important is the angle at which you make your hack. And, and here's why. Here's the letter L, that's a 90 degree angle. You wanna be halfway, 45 degrees. Why? If you make your angle tighter, closer to the tree, you're, you're taking the risk that you're gonna hack at it and your hatchet is gonna glance off. Now you've got an out of control hatchet in your hand and that's not a safe situation. So you wanna get out to the point where when you hit it, it's gonna stick in. <clears throat> the next thing is uh, you wanna try to create a nice wide opening, as you can see here, so that when you apply your herbicide, it's all gonna go inside and you're not gonna waste a lot on the outside uh, trying to hit the bark. I mean, herbicide will not penetrate through the bark. So the little trick here is let's say you've, you've whacked it in like, like this, now you want to kind of twist it outward so that you open up that hack 
So it becomes a pocket in order to insert your herbicide. Um, and with a little bit of practice, if you haven't done this before, you start using a hatchet or a machete, whatever it is, you learn to hit and right at the point of impact, bend your hand out. Just bend it out and you're gonna open this up nice and wide. Because what I try to do is I try to stick the nozzle of my sprayer right in the hack. What I don't wanna do is this. You know, this is just wasted herbicide here. You know, what do you wanna do that for? It's, it's not going to affect the tree. It's costing you money because this stuff isn't free and you're putting herbicide into the ecosystem that you don't need to. Now, another really important point, uh, I talked about girdling. If you were to do your hacks continuously around the tree, you will have severed all of the uh, vascular system. And now the tree is gonna kick into its survival mechanism and pop up root sprouts. And you lost the game. Because the purpose of using herbicide is to kill the tree without causing it to sprout roots. So you have to leave space. <clears throat> you have to leave a fair amount of untouched vascular system. So that's simple enough. You hack, leave space, you hack, leave space, you hack, leave space all around. So you've cut basically half of the vascular system and left the other half intact. In fact, another name for this technique, it's sometimes called frill, <clears throat> frill girdling. Okay. So here's the problem if you don't use an herbicide. Here's an ailanthus, and this is a, a natural blowdown. The tree was blown down, and it goes into a survival mode, and um, it starts popping up all these root sprouts. So the entire root system is trying to push up new growth because there's a tremendous amount of stored energy in the roots. And even though the top of the tree isn't functioning anymore, it can start new growth uh, through root sprouting. And you don't want that to happen because this is a big maintenance job for you. Keep in mind, uh, well, I'll show you an example later. <clears throat> so my formula for, uh, for the ideal hack and squirt combination is, you know, do the technique correctly. I just described the technique for you. Next is use the right herbicide. Now the uh, Virginia Department of Forestry has out a document that's a research-based set of recommendations on what techniques to use for what uh, invasive plants, and if herbicide is involved, what herbicide to use. And for Ailanthus, they recommend triclopyr. Um, lots of people use uh, glyphosate. They do not recommend it. They recommend triclopyr. And the commercial brand names for triclopyr products are uh, Garlon 3A, Alligar 3, and there are others. Look for the cheapest one because the active ingredient is all the same. <clears throat> Next thing, in addition to using the right technique, using the right herbicide is using the right concentration. And the Virginia Department of Forestry's research-based recommendation is for triclopyr undiluted. Don't dilute it. Use it straight out of the bottle, which is at 44%. Um, next, uh, when to do it. Uh, you can successfully treat Hylanthus with herbicide any time of year except when it's leafing out in the spring. But the most effective time is during the growing season. And around here in um, uh, Piedmont, Virginia, that's uh, about mid June to mid August. Uh, now you can treat it after that. I mean, right now, what's, what's happening for, for lots of trees and Hylanthus uh, in particular, because it has a relatively short growth period. Uh, it doesn't leaf out until about, you know, it's fully leafed out about the uh, first week of June or so here, and it's going to start losing its leaves in September. That's that's a pretty short growing period, but it does really well in that growing period. <clears throat> so right now, it's starting to taper off on photosynthesis, which means the pressure downward that carries your herbicide in the roots is getting to be lower. And it's, you know, it's basically diminished by the time uh, it goes dormant. So the best time is in the growing season. You can still do it during dormancy. You do not wanna to try to treat uh, Hylanthus during its leaf out phase, which around here is mid April to early June. And, and the reason for that is during leaf out, all of the movement of, of liquids in the tree from the roots 
is upward. And there's no downward movement because there's no, there's no leaves up there yet. So you have a strong pressure upward in the vascular system. And it makes it hard for the herbicide that you try to apply using either a uh, cut stomp or hack and squirt to get down into the roots because everything's going up. You know, the sap is rising. So best time during the growing season, second best time in dormancy. Don't touch it uh, for that short period in the spring when it's leafing out, mid-April to early June around here. And as an herbicide user, we always emphasize read and follow the label directions for your own safety and to minimize impact on uh, native plants. <laughs> okay, so let me give you a what if here. Um, what if you treat an ailanthus and it doesn't appear that you've killed it? Now, yeah, here's, a, here's one that I treated last January and I took this photo last week. Okay, and here's, here's the trunk of it. I hacked it twice. It was a small one, it's only about five inches. There's only room for two hacks you still have to leave some viable uh, vascular tissue. But you can see this side of the tree is dead. This one's not. It's still producing leaves. It's still photosynthesizing. If it was a female, it probably wouldn't produce seed because it's definitely her. I heard it badly. So the question is, did I kill it? And um, so here's two things you can do with it. First is <clears throat> don't do anything with it. Leave it and come back to this tree um, next June or July, you know, into the growing season, fully leaf it should be fully leafed out if, if it's unaffected. My guess is it'll be dead by then. So it's possible you won't kill it right away. Uh, the fastest you could probably kill it's a, a month, month and a half or so, but it can take up to two seasons. So you could just leave it and, and come back and check on it again at the next growing season. If it's dead, great. If it's not dead, you can then retreat it. Now, if you're never going to see this tree again, like like me, I, I work in one area and then I'm not, I'm never back there again. I'm in another area and then another area. And I'm never going back. So I don't have the option of waiting until next year. <clears throat> so I would retreat this. Now, keep in mind, I've only got two places I can hit it. I hit it here. I hit it here. I've got this spot here. And the other side's a mirror image. There's a spot back there where the vascular tissue is, un tissue is untouched. So I'm just gonna hack it once. Let's say right here. And I'm going to introduce my herbicide. And now, um, just to be certain, I'll probably wait about 30 seconds and then I'll spray it again. Okay, so now if I put in a, instead of being two milliliters or so, maybe I put in four milliliters. So I put in a good dose. And uh, I don't have any doubt that this tree is going to be dead in a fairly short order. So those are your options if you didn't kill it the first time. Wait and see or retreat it. <clears throat> All right, let's, let's talk uh, briefly about situations where you can't use hack and squirt. You know, this is a technique we want to use as much as we can because it's fast, it's efficient, um, it's effective. But, you know, you can't do it here. I mean, what happens when you kill a tree in place using hack and squirt, and what happens with most trees, most trees don't fall over the day after you do this. What happens is the, you know, there's no more water moving upward. The tree dries out. The leaves wilt. The leaves change color. They fall off. And then the branches start to become brittle because they're not getting any water and they start to die and they start to fall and they typically fall straight down. So the branches break and fall down, the trunk pieces start to break and fall down. And some of these are pretty sizable pieces, you know, five and six foot lengths. We're talking, you know, several hundred pounds. You can't have that happening over a roadway or a parking lot or your house or a school or a playground. You can't have it happening next to a road or a hiking trail or utility lines. You, utility easements. So in these situations, you can't use hack and squirt. And the technique you'll use is called cut stump. And I showed you this before, that the tree's been cut down. And now an herbicide, small amount of herbicide is going to be applied right around the edges where the vascular tissue is. You don't ever want to do this. 
you don't need herbicide the center of the of the stump because there's no movement through the vascular system there. They're all dried up. The movement is right on the edge. And in fact, you can see it in this photo pretty clearly. See how there's a light color right here and here and down here? That's where the vascular tissue is. And if it's already started to absorb, that's why it's light colored because it's been sucked down in or drawn down in by gravity. So <clears throat> you only have to put the herbicide on the edge. You don't need a lot of herbicide for any of these techniques. Uh, another technique you can use is a foliar spray, you know, spraying. And there are only limited circumstances where you can do this. You can only do it for ones that are relatively small, or you can get the wand of your sprayer on top of it. You never want to be spraying upward because you lose control of your spray and it could, first it can come back and affect you, but it can miss your target and hit non-target species, particularly native species. You don't want to do that. So Ilantis is a pretty good target as long as they're, you know, maybe five feet high or lower. And you just spray the leaves. So it is a viable technique and it's it's very fast. It's faster than going through here and cutting everyone individually with a, a pair of loppers or, <clears throat> or a hand pulling the ones you can hand pull, breaking the ones you can't. That's very time consuming. Foliar is faster. So it's an option for you for the small ones. And of course, if you're doing this, you, know, you wanna be paying attention to personal protective equipment. You want gloves, um, you want eye protection. You want a long sleeve shirt, long pants, uh, ideally high rubber boots. You know, particularly if you're spraying down towards the ground level and you're, you're usually spraying in front of you, you're gonna be walking through it. You want rubber boots, high rubber boots. Okay, so what if you're not an herbicide user? Can you control Ilanthus? And the answer is, uh, um, in some situations, yes, um, and with a lot of work, because the purpose of the herbicide is to keep the tree from root sprouting when you kill it. And if you don't use the herbicide, you're gonna get root sprouting, which is gonna make a lot of work for you. So let's look at some examples of where you might be able to do it. <clears throat> let's say, uh, lucky you, that you've got a nice big ailanthus in your backyard. Okay, it's on your lawn. So cut it down. The tree goes away, you know, you, you cut it up. It, it has a pretty good BTU rating. You can use it for firewood. Some people I know use it for some woodworking. It's, it's suitable for some kinds of woodworking. Um, mulch chips are great. Uh, if it's a female, don't <laughs> wait till there's no seed around. Anyhow, what's gonna happen is, you know, we're looking at a tree here that's this wide. The root system is three times as wide as that. So picture the tree being this wide. It's, the root system goes out this far on this side, this far on that side, 360 degrees. So basically your whole backyard is covered underneath by the root system. So you're gonna get root sprouts all over your yard. You're gonna get a hundred of them, but it's your lawn, you mow it once a week or whatever, right? So cut this tree at the beginning of the growing season, just before the first time you're going to mow. And you're going to get root sprouts, mow them. And next week you'll get new root sprouts and you'll mow them. And next week you'll get new root sprouts. So it's going to go on and on and not just one season, but probably two, three, maybe even four growing seasons. Each time fewer and fewer root sprouts because the stored energy in the roots is being exhausted. But it's not a one year job or a two year job. It goes on for quite a while. But it's kind of manageable in this situation here. <clears throat> it's a little less manageable here when the tree's in your front yard and is sitting there on the boundary with your neighbor. You don't care, you're gonna mow and you don't mind looking at all these root sprouts coming up, but your neighbor might. So say you've got some open space, you know, you got some acreage and you got a couple or a few ailanthus. You're not mowing back there, but you could bush hog. But sooner or later, you're going to reach the limits. If you got them out in your forest, and you got a lot of them, it's it's just this is this is what you see in the way of root sprouting. Okay, you know, dozens and dozens of them. Uh, this happens to be on a steep slope. You you couldn't get a, a bush hog out there. Um, so the, the point of whether you can control ailanthus without herbicide really has to do with how many there are, where they're located, 
how much time you have to follow up on this, whether you've got a workforce. I mean, if you, if you own a farm and you've got a crew, maybe you can do this. Okay, so I'd like to wish you all luck and I hope that all of your trees heaven look like this and all of your spotted lanternfly look like this. Good luck. Thanks, Tim. Um, we um, only have a few minutes left for um, a few questions. So I want to turn it over to Tom and Natalie. Um, Natalie, you here? Yep. I wanted to go ahead and see if um, there are any questions for Lori with regards to spotted lanternfly. Can you yeah. give us one? Yep. Um, the questions were pretty similar, but um, David asked, when do egg masses appear in Virginia? And should we keep our eyes out all the time? Uh, yes, you should keep your eyes out all the time, always and forever. Um, but egg masses are laid in the fall and they overwinter. So I find that uh, the best time to look is in the winter when the trees have dropped their leaves. It just makes it easier to see um, and they won't hatch until the spring. So I personally think winter is the best time to look. Okay. There are no other questions for spotted lanternfly. Okay, great. Okay, Tom, we're going to go right into control of Atlantis. Can yeah. you give us your <clears throat> most popular sure. question? Yep. Hey, Tim, this is a, this is so a lot of folks had questions about controlling Atlantis. Um, for instance, when you treat your trees, how long do you expect it'll take before you see results? And also, if you cut the trees or hand pull them, is there a certain practice for disposing them? Uh, can you just leave them laying on the ground, or should you chip them or burn them? Yes, yes, no, and yes. Good. Okay. Next question. All right. Let's let's see if we can break that down. Uh, what's the best time of year? We we talked about time of year. You don't want to treat them in the spring when they're leafing out. It's ideal to treat them during the growing season. You know, June, July, August. Um, you can treat them during dormancy in the winter. Um, next question, or one of the questions, was: uh, Can you hand pull them and leave them lying there? Will they reroot? And, and my understanding is no, they won't. I've never seen it happen. What other questions were there in there? How long to see results when you treat them? Yeah, well, it depends. Uh, I've seen it as quick as two weeks. You'll see, we'll, um, first thing that's going to happen is that the if you're doing it during the growing season is the leaves are going to turn yellow. You, you know you got it. Next thing that's going to happen is they're going to start to wilt. Next thing that's going to happen is they're going to start to fall off. So you can see it within a couple of weeks, and it can take a couple of years. Uh, you you will see results sooner, but it may not be at the point where you 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 know you get into June or July, the height of the growing season, and one that you treated two years ago, that you saw some leaves on last year, you don't see them anymore. Okay, that varies. Okay. Yeah, that varies. Do you have another question for us, Tom? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, um, if 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 uh, you don't mind me asking another one, so the next question is. Um, you were talking about cut stump as one possible way of controlling Ilanthus, uh, but there is some uh, information online that says cut stump doesn't work. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, well, um, <clears throat> I have never cut down an Ilanthus. And the reason is I work where you don't have to, where heck and squared is, is the technique to use. Uh, but I've done cut stump on everything else under the sun. You know, uh, I, my focus is typically on woody invasives, trees, um, shrubs, and vines. And it sure as heck works on vines and shrubs. So I don't, I have never heard that it does not work on, uh, on, on, on Atlantis. Have you? No, I think that that maybe one of the questions is, is if you cut it and if you kill it too fast, it'll re-sprout before, uh, the herbicide gets to all the the roots. I think that was one, maybe one of the uh, yeah. the concerns about cut stump versus hack and squirt. So maybe just to be safe, use hack and squirt. Yeah, but you know, my there are situations that I described where you simply can't do that. Right. So my guess would be that if somebody treated um, a felled tree with the cut stump technique and didn't and got root sprouts, that it's an issue of what herbicide was used, the concentration that was used. Yeah, I, th I think that's where the problem would be. It, there should not be any problem. If you're using the right, if you're using triclopyr, 44%, you're going to kill it. 
That okay. that leads. Do we have a Do we have a second to respond to that? Because there's two questions related to exactly what. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, the first one is so if it resprouts and you're going to foliar spray, do you have to get the spray on all of the leaves and stems, or can you just get a partial spray on what you can reach? And and the second part of that is you just mentioned using 44% trickle pair. Is that something people can the public can buy? Oh, okay, well, that's <clears throat> so <clears throat> for foliar application that the general rule is you try to spray as much of the available leaf space as you can, and you try to get the leaves wet, but not to the point of dripping. Now, the next thing is concentration. Now, when I was talking about 44%, I was talking about hack and squirt and cut stump, the direct application approaches. For foliar, you use a very heavily diluted concentration. Uh, two to four percent. Okay, so you put a lot of water in there. But as I mentioned, you 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 want to you want to get all the leaves that you can reach wet, but not to the point of dripping, because then you're just wasting herbicide. Would you modify that, Tom? Or do you think we're good? Yeah, I think you're good. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's 1:02 p.m. Natalie, I wanted to ask if you had any other questions that you had on your queue. Um, um, for us, or have they all been answered? Not all of them, but there are quite a bit, <laughs> quite a bit more okay. questions. Do you have any more for Lori? Um, yeah, how high will a spotted lantern fly lay eggs? Um, well, why don't we make uh, that uh, question for Lori be our last one? So okay. one, uh, I'll let you read it out loud. They'll, they'll lay their eggs at the very top of the tree. There, there's no limit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, any? Do you have any um, any connecting questions to that, or are we all set on those questions, Natalie? Go back up. While she's looking, I just want to thank everyone again for joining us today. I know I learned a lot. Um, and just remember, we will be sending you um, a link to the recording, which is on our YouTube channel. And once you get to our YouTube channel, why not go ahead and sign up to receive notifications for that for all the um, new recordings that we have coming up on there. So join our YouTube channel. We'd love to see you there. Um, Natalie, do you have anything else? Or It looks like Lori's replying to Gail. Um, Spotted Lantern Lanternfly in Bedford County was just announced in the last week. I don't know if it's an established popula population or not. Have you heard? Uh, yes, it has been confirmed in Bedford um, and that was confirmed by VDAC. So I'm assuming it's an established population. Um, I, ha I have not seen it, so I don't know how big it is, but usually they don't um, tell partners unless it is an established population. Okay, thank you. That looks well, like the last spot in life and slide. Okay. Hey. Great. Well, with that, I think we're just going, we're going to end this webinar. Thanks again to everyone. And once again, if you have questions for Lori or Tim, please go ahead and email us at info at blueridgeprism.org and we'll make sure they get them and get back to you. Thanks so much Thank and have you. a great rest of your day. And thanks for spending your lunch with us. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Natalie, Tom, yeah. Tim and Lori.